When people's thinking clears up, what's possible grows. Episode 128. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I am your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I'm in my favourite spot overlooking the Thames and I've got a fabulous guest, Polly Bateman, who is a performance and mindset coach whose specialism, if you like, is she's able to draw out your hidden inner blocks, obliterate them, and she whips you into action towards your highest potential. Now, Polly is an absolute powerhouse. She's brilliant. She's worked with all sorts of uh, clients from all walks of life, entrepreneurs, C-suite executives, public figures, world-class athletes, actors, artists, creatives, companies, education establishments, and uh, sports teams. And she's trained in ontological and transformational coaching. And in this conversation, um, Polly discusses how to identify hidden inner blocks to performance and how they can be removed and how you can take yourself forward um, to reaching those high levels of performance. So sit back, relax and enjoy the incredible Polly Bateman. So massive thank you to all of you for listening and supporting the Business of Architecture UK for the last couple of years. Big shout out to those of you who have come to our live events, attended the webinars, and of course to those of you who have downloaded the weekly podcast and have been listening to them on your bicycles. And as you know, we love helping architects win meaningful and profitable work, but it's not always that simple to implement these ideas or translate them into something that will work for you. So what I wanted to do was to invite you onto a quick 15 minute chat with myself we can both grab a cup of tea and I'd like to ask you about what content you found most valuable and why and what you'd like to hear more of and I'd also love to hear more about your business and what you're building at the moment and where you were headed to business wise in 2020 so there's no charge or any obligation with this call just simply to find out how our content has been of value and if we get that far and with your permission of course what might be next what might be possible and how Business of Architecture UK could be supportive of that. Does that sound fair? Brilliant. So if you want to book a 15-minute chat with me, I'm calling these calls the BOA UK Discovery Call or just simply a chat with Ryan. Use the link in the information and I look forward to speaking to you. Today I'm sitting with Mindset and Performance Coach Polly Bateman. Welcome to the show. Hello. Absolute pleasure to be sitting here over this beautiful view of the Thames. Yeah, it's gorgeous. And to be uh, talking to you about hidden inner blocks. Yeah. So this was one of the things that kind of perked my interest up. And we've had, come with, we've, you know, we've, we've spoken a lot about performance before and mm -hmm. what, it, what gets in people's way, particularly high performers, CEOs, business people. Um, and this is kind of your, your niche, your... Your specialty, the area I landed on, yeah. Yeah. So how did how did it begin, and what is what are these kind of hidden inner blocks? What is it that stops people from achieving the things that they want to be achieving? Mm, great question. So for me, um, a little bit of backstory would probably be really helpful. I've been a coach since two thousand and six, and I didn't realise to begin with until I furthered my training that actually there are three levels to coaching. So the way I have it now is that the first level of coaching is very much positive mindset, action orientated, goal setting, you know, keeping the motivation up. And it's really good. Don't get me wrong. You know, that always makes your life better if you're going to think like that and be like that for sure. And then I got a little cleverer as we took my training to another level and I started doing neuro-linguistic programming and things like that. And of course, then you get to be able to do neurological hacks, how to trick the body into being excited about things it wouldn't normally be excited about. Can you give us an example? Of what, yeah. What, I mean, is, like what, what, is, what is neuro-linguistic programming? So NLP is it's the neurology, the linguistics, the language you're using and the programming you bring to the party. So it's... Uh, so your culture and your background are all very much in that. NLP is very clever in that it talks to you, well, it teaches you how to use language. So if you say, I should do this right now, and it's some project, you're, auto you're automatically and instantly turning off your brain. If you connect what you're doing, because you've just said the word should, right? Nobody yeah, should yeah, yeah. anything. But if you say, you know, particularly with children, if I say, oh, I'd really love it if you could come and help me, Harry then actually my son is suddenly enrolled in helping me because I used the word love and how it told him how much I'd love it. I spoke to his sort of warmer side. Um, if you uh, say must, I mean, if you think, what's your favorite thing, Ryan? What do you love to do? Give me something you love doing. 
podcasts. You love doing podcasts. Great. So if I suddenly mustered and shudded all over you about what you should be doing on your podcast. Oh. Yeah. Can you see how there's an instant resistance? Yeah. But if I sort of just left you to book them freely and to, you know, you love doing it, even if it's something like skiing, I, I love skiing, but if I have to go skiing, I have a different reaction. So if I want to go skiing and I say I love skiing. So, you know, even now as a skier, um, if I want to take some time out from the slopes when I'm skiing, because I've had a really hard morning skiing, I'll take the time out in the afternoon because I don't, I don't have to do it. Mm. So it's using words that are really good at enrolling our brain. But equally, NLP is very good because we think in pictures. So if I ask you to think about a blue dog with yellow spots right now, you're going to start imagining that, right? So if you think of the favorite pet that you've ever had, you're going to imagine that. That's how we think. We think in pictures. And therefore, if we've got a picture, we're traumatized by something, I can actually deal with that now with um, an NANLP practitioner can do this. You can deal with it without even having to ask the person to out what the problem is. So I've had people who don't want to tell me the traumatic details of the incident. They just want it gone. Mm. So what you can do is you can kind of take the picture and you play with it because the mind doesn't care between something that's imagined and something that's real. It just likes the one that has a better impact on its physiology. Which is why if you say to a child, don't smile, they'll smile because they're, 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 most children are polarity responders. And then the impact on their body when they've been a bit grumpy is the physiology goes, oh yeah, we know about this. We know what that means. And they, their mood is instantly lifted. And NLP, it's all around that. It's all around, you know, getting your body to think about the right pictures, having the impact on your physiology that means that you suddenly feel different. And if you're really clever, you can find out what your values are and suddenly you're cleaning the loo one day, but you're attaching it to your higher values and cleaning the loo isn't such a bad thing anymore, you know, because it's what you really want. Or it's, there are times, right, when people are coming around for dinner, we all run around clearing up and we want the house to look amazing. Mm. And there's times when you're not doing it for anyone. And it's a real drag. So when the motivation is there, that's what NLP is about. It's about putting the motivation there when it's not naturally there. Right. OK, so it's kind of changing those internal conversational structures or the language structures, yeah. both visual and like verbal structures yeah. that your mind is kind of operating on. Yeah. And it's really, really helpful and it's really good. But the one thing that I became really aware of was I, I hit 2016. So I've been 10 years a coach and I hit 2016 and my husband went away for a one year tour to the Middle East, which meant he didn't ring me unless he could. Well, he did as often as he could. But even when he did, the conversation only went one way, me to him. Yeah. There wasn't much he could talk about. And at the same time, our only child started boarding school. And I was six miscarriages in at this point. So this wasn't an intentional only child either. So I was pretty heartbroken mm. that my family had suddenly disappeared. And I had my own WTF moment. Here I was, alone. We'd had to move. My husband's military and we move every two years. We'd had to move out of the house that we'd been in because it had, the previous property had been tied to the job that he'd previously been doing. And suddenly I'm in an area where I don't know anyone and I'm completely alone. I was fine for about six months, but at the nine month point, I was definitely depressed. And I wasn't going to the doctors depressed. I was just really, really down. And that's when I kind of recognized that coaching or not, and all the things I'd learned, they made me brilliant at coping with stuff, but nothing had actually changed. And what I wanted was to change. Mm. What I wanted was a different reality. So I set about digging into myself and over the next 18 months, I turned myself inside out to find out why do I do what I do, think what I think, feel the way I feel, what has me show up in the world the way I show up in the world. And what I discovered is that we're essentially the sum of our experiences. Now I knew that before, I logically understood that principle before, but I didn't know it like I know it now. Mm. And to explain it a bit better, I want you to imagine that every single experience you've ever had in your life comes with its own little color code droplet of ink and it drops onto the lens that you view life through. So by the time we get to today, you've got one very unique color and I've got another very unique color. But here's the Here's the catch. It's not just that you've got purple and I've got yellow, for example, and therefore that tinges your view. It taints your view of the world, especially if you're looking at something that's a bit purple. You won't see it as clearly. But also, you actually project that view onto the world. So you actually go out looking for the evidence. So I'll give you an example. My mother used to be quite rude to waiters and waitresses in restaurants, and I used to cringe. I absolutely hated it when she did it. I'd find it awkward and embarrassing, and I wouldn't know where to look or put myself. Today, I'm really sensitive to how people treat waiters and waitresses. And if someone is a bit sharp with a waiter or waitress, 
I, I'm like, I get in the way of myself. I have a reaction to that. Now I'm evolved enough in my training now. I don't leap out my seat and do anything about it, but I do have a conversation with myself in my own head. So the other day I heard some Middle Eastern people being very sharp with a waitress who also looked like she was probably Middle Eastern. And they were like, no, 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 take it away, take it away. We don't want, take, Ugh, not nice. And they were sort of being very abrupt like this. And I was like, oh man, okay, I hope she's okay. So I was kind of keeping an eye out for her. She looked fine. And of course it was all in my head, the story. Yeah. But the point being, when they left, I heard them say goodbye to her. They couldn't have been nicer. They were like, thank you so much. That was so nice. So I have a sensitivity towards that. But someone who didn't grow up with that view, with those experiences, probably would never have noticed that. Mm. Not in a million years. They won't have even seen it. And what that does is it brings us to a point today where you and I could both be watching a woman on stage. And one of us might think she was inspirational and, and really dynamic and out there. And the other one of us might think that she was just a stroppy wench banging on about her points and the reason we two people can look at the same thing and see something entirely different is because of those experiences you've had and how you then look for evidence that those experiences were the way you thought they were so how does this start to impact us in terms of wanting to accomplish things or entering into certain levels of of performance yeah and how do you go about changing these past experiences is there any is there anything that we can do about them Yes, there really is. That's the great thing. That's what I discovered. So you have to clean up your thinking. What I realized only afterwards as well, I didn't know that my performance had been as impacted as it has been, but I made lots of realizations about why. So the way where I start off with my clients is I say, there's, there's the life you've got and inside all of us is an unlived life. I love that phrase. I read it in a book about procrastination, about the unlived life. And I'm like, ah, I'm having that one. So there's the life you've got and the unlived life. And what I do is I start with my clients. Okay, how are we going to bridge the gap? How are we going to get from there to there? Because it's you that's having your life. You are at the source of your life exactly the way it is and exactly the way it is. And for everything you do and don't want in your life, I swear you've put it there. Because on some level, the stuff that you don't want serves you. Because if it didn't, you wouldn't have it there. What do you mean by that? So if you had a friend that came round, let's, let's pick something that's really gross, like a proper hard line. If you had a friend that came round and never used the loo appropriately, <laughs> or, <laughs> I'm going to go with something that really we can all resonate with, right? Um, and, and they missed every time. You might not want to have that friend come round because if you're constantly clearing up after that friend, it's going to become a red line. And in the end, you're not going to meet that person at home. Yeah. And if you do, well, you knew what was going to happen, right? So we have hard lines. I'm like, you can think of all sorts of examples, but we've all had someone where we're like, yeah, I'm not having them come around if they're going to behave like that. So we have our, our judgments about people and the way we want things to be. If you really don't want something in your life, you will not have it in your life. If you say you don't want something, but it's there in your life, then trust me, there's a question to have. How is this serving me? Mm. Because what most of us like to do well, there's a great quote, actually, um, and I can't remember it properly now. I ought to find it for you. But basically, it's about how the mind creates your reality and then says, I didn't do it. So we create things to be in our life. And then we love to blame externally. We mm. love to pretend we're not powerful. Marianne Williamson said this herself in that beautiful speech that was in the Invictus film. You know, it's our greatest fear is not our darkness. Our greatest fear is our power and light. She said it much better. Mm, yeah. <laughs> but it is true. That's our greatest fear. So what we love to do is take ourselves out all the time and we keep our power, you know, down. We keep but ourselves th numb. Th this, is, this is so interesting. And, the, you, you know, you, you pointed there as well that we get into this state where we're constantly believing or we believe that the external circumstances is what it is. It's the reality. Yeah. And it's the reason why something's not happening for us or why we're not yeah. getting the results we want to have. And what you're saying here is that there's also there's a, some sort of hidden payoff or there's some sort totally. of hidden... Like if you've got something in your life and you keep saying you don't want it... But you keep putting it there, like you keep on having failed relationships. Yeah, the, yeah. there's something there that's in a weird way is working for you. Yes, absolutely. Right. So I have a girlfriend at the moment. I can talk about her very freely. <laughs> um, she keeps on having inappropriate relationships. Right. Like they're just people who are either already with somebody or half her age or it's so obviously not going to work out. 
And then she has the relationship, it fails and goes, oh my God, why can't I find love? And it's like, well, <laughs> other people's blind spots are really obvious to us. They can't see it so clearly themselves, but it's really obvious why it's not working out. We all know it before it's even started. Like, really, is she going to go there? Oh my God, she's doing it again. So, you know, on some level, when I've explored it with her, which I do, because I hold her to account over this, she actually genuinely gets down to it. She admits she's scared. Mm. She's really scared of being hurt. So she goes into relationships that she knows are going to fail because there's her confirmation bias occurring. There's her, you know, she's projecting her color onto the world, her viewpoint. Ah, there you go. I was right. You can't trust people. You're going to get hurt. Mm. And therefore, she just keeps repeating the same cycle. So how does this type of thing play out in business then in your experience? So what, what type of clients do you typically have? Is it, is it for all sorts of different disciplines, different industries? And I know you work a lot with high-performing business people. Yeah, so actually just to back it up a little bit, just to sort of fill the gap on me, what I realized when I went through this process right. is I really cleared up my thinking because what I hadn't appreciated is that these thoughts about myself, this, the way I kept the stuff I didn't want in my life alive and, and well, these thoughts were actually, um, they're like sea anchors. They're invisible. They're hooked into you. And what happened for me is right at the end of my training, I unfortunately had my seventh miscarriage and uh, found out the baby, and there's a reason I tell you this, found out the baby had died on the Thursday, had it taken out on the Friday, and we were going on a pre-booked, long pre-booked and very expensive ski holiday. And I say it's expensive because actually there were a few families going to make it all very affordable for us. And my son was having a ski holiday with his school friends and I really didn't want to spoil that. And of course, I was well-practiced now at dealing with miscarriages by this point, much as they really hurt. Mm. And this baby had got further along as well, so I was really um, sad to lose this one. Well, sad to lose them all, but you know what I mean. Anyway, the point being is that I got onto the ski slopes. Now, when I was young, I was a bit of a demon skier. My mother said I used to terrify her. From five years old onwards, I had no poles. I'd just stick my uh, skis on and I'd go straight down in a complete straight line all the way to the bottom and then straight back up again and do it all over again. And she would be terrified. As I got older, I noticed I became a more cautious skier. It kind of hurt when I fell over. I got stiffer. And then when I had Harry, I started to want to be careful because in my head I was running through scenarios of like, oh, I can't, I can't fall over now because I've really got to make this work later. Or how am I going to get us all home? And, you know, how am I going to look after people? So I had become more and more cautious. And that's actually what happens in life. The experiences we've had, falling over, feeling tired, all of those things, actually mean that we become a little more rigid in our bodies and in our thinking. Right. That's why old people barely leave the house sometimes. You know, they get to the point where they'd rather pay for the expensive car insurance than actually shop around because they want to stick to what they know. Mm. You know, they go to the same shop, they eat the same foods. Their circles get smaller because they've become less flexible in their thinking. So here I am skiing and I've done all this training. I've turned myself inside out. I've looked and taken responsibility for why what's in my life that I didn't want is there. And some of it really hurt, really hurt going in there. I don't think I've ever cried as much as I did that year. And I'm skiing like a demon. And I just realized something was different. I was skiing like I used to ski when I was 12 and free. And that's when I was like, oh my God, I'm onto something. How can I be out here in pain genuinely full of grief and yet skiing so well the grief was the grief I could acknowledge it for what it was but it wasn't running my day mm. and I realized there was a lot less noise in my head running my day so our identity is so busy being right about what it thinks is its view of the world making judgments writing stories you know thinking in pictures that don't really work for you that it literally hampers your performance it hampers what you can see as possible because you are only looking for your view of the world. When you get that and can move your, your thought processes to one side regardless and say to yourself, I mean, the consistent question to ask is, so what's possible here? Mm. Well, what's possible always brings something back onto the table that you might have thought. Because if you can think it, it's possible. One of the things I love to say to people is, you know, in caveman times, rockets were possible. Just no one had put the elements together at that stage, you know? And that's the truth, right? They were all there and it was possible, <laughs> just not with those limited cavemen. Yeah, yeah. So the way it impacts performance and what I've seen is that actually I, uh, there's a lot of coaching out there in those levels of coaching. I realize I now sit in transformational coaching and ontological coaching, the way you're being. Mm. What, I'm, what I'm very clear about is that when you get 
how you're being is at the root of everything. So I work with companies uh, and so on some very exciting projects sometimes. You know, I've had briefs that have ranged from um, CEOs not sure if they want to stay in their companies anymore because they've sort of lost their vision a little bit or they've got a little bit bored uh, to people who want to take their companies from where they're currently trading to exponential growth um, to people who just are, said, I've been unhappy all my life and I don't know why. When they start to see why you do what you do, why you feel the way you feel about something, well, then you get to choose differently. Because here's the rub. When we were little, most of the experiences that formed you the way you are today actually occurred when your brain had limited capacity. So if you were laughed at for something at school, the, whatever you were laughed at, well, you will have then avoided that behavior again in the future. You'll have written a story about it. You'll have said to yourself, oh, that was uncomfortable. And this will have happened in seconds without much conscious thought going on. I want to stay in the tribe. I'd like to stay safe. I'm not going to stick myself out on, the, on a limb there, unless you're one of those comedian types, in which case they then go out of their way because the feedback loop that they were getting is that being really funny was excellent and they loved that, yeah. that kind of attention. So it goes one of both ways. So it's kind of like a deep-wired... It's a deep-wired thing. ...programming thing. There's yeah. also triggered by a sort of safety mechanism of the brain to kind totally. of keep us... Totally. Because your brain is purely built for survival. Right. It, it does want to thrive, but it's firstly built for survival. Right. So your brain wants to keep you safe, keep you in the tribe, and keep you aligned with everybody else because that's comfortable. So anything that occurred as uncomfortable as a child, you will instantly filter down and go, yeah, I'm not going to do that again. Didn't like that. 25 years later... You might feel awkward asking a girl out on a date because you asked a girl to play kiss chase when you were six and she said, Ugh, no thanks. And now you don't know why in bars you can't talk to women. But all you know is you've got some kind of block and stop in there that says, don't do that, don't do that, it's dangerous. And you don't even, again, you don't even have the conscious thought. Mm. So when we start to free up some of those thoughts, because what I do with people, as I said, I start with that structure. Where are you now and where do you want to go? Okay. Well, what, what's interesting as well is to, what's the difference then between understanding this on an intellectual level and then actually embodying it so it makes change because I'll often I can understand these concepts and these ideas and they're quite they're obvious in a way you, you can yeah, go, they yeah, resonate I, don't yeah, they but you can like I can get that what's the difference what's the shift between understanding it like an academic or like a psych like, like, like you would if you were studying psychology to actually being like to getting this it. is my life <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I re that's a really great question, Ryan. It's experiential learning. Right. So I can pontificate about this stuff and it resonates. And this is pretty much how I start my conversations on my discovery calls with clients when they're right. interested in working with me. They all intellectually get this because actually it's why I like working with high performers because a high performer will be prepared to give something a go. Mm. So I had a guy, that, um, I, no names mentioned obviously, but I had a guy the other day who was really irritated by something that had happened between his department and marketing in a big corporation. And I asked him why. And he said, well, I didn't like the way the email was written. I'm like, okay, what did it say? And so he gave me a couple of lines from the email and I instantly heard that she just wanted to get aligned with him. But he heard that she was a bit cheesed off with him. And I'm like, this is so interesting. And I said, tell me about the marketing department. I didn't know it was from her at this point or, or uh, her. And he said, well, there were three people. I said, how'd you get on with them? He said, I don't really. And I said, okay, I got it. Who do you like? He gave me the name of the person he liked. I said, who do you dislike? He gave me the name and it was a lady's name. And I went, great, here's the challenge. I need to take her out for lunch. <laughs> He was just staring at me and for a while I wasn't sure if he was actually going to take me on. I said, take her out for lunch. And this is how the conversation's going to go. I said, you're going to ask her what she meant when she sent you that email after you've got to know her a little bit. And I said, you're not going to tell her how you felt and what it meant for you because that's irrelevant to the conversation and the exercise. You're just going to say the way it occurred to you was that she was maybe a bit cross and could you just find out why? And I said, just get into her world and find out what's going on with her. You have no idea why she comes to work and is the way she is. So you have to come back and tell me one positive quality about her. And I can't wait. I literally can't wait to see him and find out what his experience was of that process. But you, you know this as well as anybody, Ryan. Often when we face something and we have a really clear and authentic conversation, it's never as bad as we thought it was going to be. Mm. Because 90% of how we've decided something's going to go was what we made up based on our bias 
that we are looking to confirm all the time. Yeah. It, it's amazing. This is, this is why I often say, you know, the most important aspect of running a business or being a professional, designing your career, accomplishing anything is actually the self-awareness of how your own subjective experience of life is being continually manufactured like right now. Yeah. And understanding how we're individually doing that, like most of us, we don't go into that exploration process. Yeah. Sometimes it's a bit ugly. Yeah, it can be. It can be. People, well, actually, people are genuinely, generally, sorry, not genuinely, but both, scared of what they might find. Mm. They say, oh, I don't want to dig all that up. I don't want to get messy. And they also have, the brain has also told them, well, we've got a measure of success going on here. And the reason it can genuinely say that is because it's, you're stood in front of me right now. Therefore, you have survived. Therefore, you have found a successful model right. to get through life. It works. It don't, works. Don't get rid of it. Don't mess with it. Yes. If it's, yeah. yeah, they don't want it to be messed with. So it takes a brave person. You know, I, I really respect all my coaches because they're brave. Mm. And that's actually why I wanted to work with high performers because they are brave enough to give stuff a go. But if I, and if I can change their world, they go back and change the, the world of the people that are around them as well. It, it, it's interesting as well because you're, what you're pointing at as well, because these filters through which we're experiencing life are kind of all pervasive that it's the little everyday moments like mm. an email or a conversation or you know someone cuts you up in traffic that are, that are actually pointing to the deeper rooted Issues. core bits yeah. of your identity through which everything of your life is being sort of played out through yeah and what I'm really clear about is every single one of us would like a little bit of relief from our own nonsense in our head sometimes. Yeah. You know, we all have, I say to my clients, you'll have very similar complaints about people. You'll say, I don't know why people always do that. And why does this always happen to me? Those are the kind of things people say because their view of the world is that this stuff happens. So they actually go out looking for it. That's the crazy thing. When you start to see that there's so much more and you start to see you're just making this up to suit your own identity and experiences that you have had up to date, mm. then you get the freedom to choose differently. And, you know, you, you asked about performance and I wanted to back it up a little bit to what had happened when I was on the ski holiday and how I got there. What I see is that when people's thinking clears up what's possible grows so instead of just going so we prior to doing this kind of work everything you do everything you think and every action right here right now is based on a past experience you look back to work out what to do now that by default has to be limiting because you're only going on what you know not on what's possible yeah you're just going to end up reliving just the, repeat. The, the, the template that you've been yep. existing on. Yep. And yeah, there are new experiences, but that's why people are so blown away by them sometimes. Like, oh my God, it survived. I went down and I was like, oh, Jesus, I didn't think it would work out like that. Or they get a yes. And, you know, there are, there are areas that people are naturally stronger in. It's one of the reasons I quite like working with people in the finance sector because they're quite ballsy. Mm. You know, they've got the balls to make decisions with money that others may prefer not to make. But I can't tell you how many of those people struggle to hold down a decent relationship. You know, so where we might be strong in one area, there'll be another. The identity loves to have its little and nooks and crannies and, and quirks. And are all these things related then, these different areas of life? So say if there's, there, sometimes you might have an extreme good performance in finance and your money, but then over here in relationships, it's kind of falling apart. And Yeah, absolutely. I found that if you excel in one area and one area particularly well, usually you can turn around and look behind and there'll be a mess in other areas because where they are so driven in one particular area, I mean, I've had people say things to me like, um, I'm really good at, my, at keeping things going at work, but my house is a mess. Or I'm really great with people, but paperwork is a nightmare for me. Mm. So what this means is that you can't roll along smoothly. Because if you have one area that's really brilliant and another area that isn't, that's going to be a bumpy ride. You need like bringing balance to everything. Now, magic doesn't happen in balance, interestingly. Yeah. Magic happens when we're out on the edges of life. So one of the people that I love to talk about when you want to really achieve magic is Bob Geldof. He blew me away when I was a child because he swore on the BBC. <laughs> 
<laughs> and it's when he brought everyone together for Band-Aid. He pulled that off in an unreasonably short amount of time. He'd seen something he couldn't live with and he decided he was going to do something about it. He pulled people together, artists from all around the world to drop what they were doing and come and record a, a, the Band-Aid single. He got Pete Waterman to push his wedding back and cancel his <laughs> wedding because he was going to get married at the time they were doing all of this. He was unreasonable in every single request that he asked. Now that's living life the way he did, being on the BBC, shouting at the public, saying, get your hands in your effing pockets, stick five pounds in a bucket, come on, we cannot have this happen he was so passionate and driven he wouldn't be able to maintain that forever mm. but like that's how you pull magic out the bag when you become unreasonable and stick your neck out on the line for something and he changed the way we we raise money today that's the first time i think we hit 20 million or whatever the figure was we hit back then and that's how we fundraise now because he did something we had never seen before and it inspired the public everybody it was disruptive everybody was talking about it and if you want to really make a difference, then you have to get unreasonable. However, to maintain yourself and your high performance long term, you've got to balance out everything. Right. You've got to keep the wheel rolling and you've got to take care. So after being as out there for something like that, afterwards you need to take a break from it. Mm. And you need to do your housekeeping elsewhere in your life. And, and is this ability to be unreasonable something that anybody can access? Or is it only for the sort of the lucky chosen ones no anybody can do this in fact you know what i'm a real believer in and i say this to all my clients and even those that don't that are not go ever going to be my clients i know how magnificent people are mm. well, they are so powerful they're so much stronger than they ever think that they could be and that's the biggest thing that they are um really capable of pulling stuff out the bag even they didn't know was possible so the magnificence of people, what I'm really clear about is that people are more powerful than they ever dare believe. And all they ever have to do, like, that's why mothers can lift cars off toddlers and mm. people can, you know, perform extreme feats. When I was 12 years old, we had a horse had an accident walking up a ramp and its foot slipped down between the gap. It was an old horse box, but there was a bit of a big gap that between the, the trailer ramp and the actual box. And I held the horse up till the vet got there and the blacksmith to saw off the thing. I don't know how I did it. I couldn't walk the next day, but it was my pony and I didn't want her to die because I knew if I didn't hold her up, she'd break her leg. So what, what is, for you, working with many clients, what are the sorts of things that enable anybody to be able to access this kind of extraordinary ability to be unreasonable do these kind of incredible feats and enter into this realm of you know very high performance is there is there like is there a golden nugget yeah is there and i'm sure it, like it's, it's not a simple thing or perhaps it, it is, is actually it is actually unbelievably simple and that that's the sort of sadness in a way that it's not more prevalent but it's self-worth right. and self-belief and that's why I get people to go and do stuff, to start believing in themselves. One of the things I say to all my clients, I love saying it and I get emotional sometimes when I say it, is I promise them I've got their back and I'll be the wind under their wings. Mm. Because so often in life, we don't know that we've got somebody that's genuinely going to be there for us. And I'm genuinely there. Even when my clients are no longer my clients, I can't tell you how many of them become my friends now. You know, and I'm like, I told you, I've got your back. You know, even when I'm seeing them 18 months later. Um, it's, it's seeing the best in somebody brings out the best in somebody. Knowing someone's magnificence allows and gives them permission to tap into theirs. Mm. I had that moment on the slopes when I was skiing when I suddenly realized I could ski again and I wasn't just, I hadn't just become this slightly novice skier again, you know, that was all a bit awkward and oh, age, it's a terrible thing. Suddenly I was skiing like a demon and I was free and I felt powerful. And then I started to change my life and my life between 2016 and today is exponentially different. I genuinely, I went from a, a frustrated wife, military wife, who couldn't really get her business off the ground and blamed her husband for it, to now I'm, I'm dealing with the kind of clients that are global that I only ever dreamt of. I mean, it blows my mind some of the people I'm having conversations with. And just recently, a very, I, I reached out to someone just to connect with them on LinkedIn. So very quick story. And he, he wrote back and said, yeah, I'd love to connect. Uh, by the way, here's my list of requirements if I'm ever going to invest in anyone I was a bit surprised because I just wanted to connect I wanted him in my circle but I was like okay 
I'll have a look at this. And he said his minimum investment was 25 million up to 250 million great, great British pounds. <laughs> and I said to my husband, what's he saying? And he read it and he said, yeah, he's asking if you want investment, honey. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I better write back then. And Tom, my husband, laughed and said, uh, no, I don't think that's a good idea. I think you should write back and just say, yeah, but we'll keep your number. That'll be really interesting one day. And I said, why? Why not now? Mm. He said, well, we don't have a plan. And I went, yeah, but if we've got a meeting with this dude, we're going to get a plan, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, actually, I have met with that guy. My husband and I went together. We put our plan of our sort of big dream to him. And he actually said to me, I want a better world for my grandchildren. I'm really interested. And we're now in further talks with him. Amazing. And, you know, deepening our business plan because he loved, loved the idea. So, you know what? Anything's possible. I'm really clear about that. If you can think it, it can happen. And for me, the experiential learning of just, just doing it anyway, you know, it goes back to that feel the fear and do it anyway. Well, do you know what? I had to get past why the fear was even there in the first place. Mm. That's what I had to distinguish. And when I got that the fear was there, that actually I have a, an old listening of myself, an old perspective that I'm worthless and I, no one's going to love me anyway. And I realized that's just a story I made up as a kid because my father wasn't around and my stepfather was a very angry man. And then my mother was very cold and distant because she was dealing with all of that. So I made up this story with that with that brain that was in survival mode, that I was the problem. And here I was 30 years later thinking that I was still the problem. Why am I here? Why am I alone? Why has my husband gone off for a year? My only child's gone to boarding school. I've got no clients. Because I was projecting out into the world that I was worthless and unlovable. Mm. And when I got past all of that was made up by an immature brain that didn't have full capacity and I could see why I'd got to where I got and I took responsibility for that. I mean, it was a kick in the nuts. I was like, oh my God, I did this to me. Damn. But equally, it's I had so the... freeing as it well. It was. Equally, it's I suddenly realized I was the one driving the car. I had the steering wheel in my hands. It's like, where do I want to go? Mm. And now, you know what? Yeah, I've gone down a few dead ends. I've dinted the uh, bumper, I expect, and I've curbed it a couple of times. But I take the foot off the accelerator when I need to, and I put it down flat when I can. Because I get it. Everything's made up. So make it up in a way that works for you. Amazing. So what's next for Polly? <laughs> well, as I said, we're in deep, <laughs> deep talks with this chap now, which is incredibly exciting. And I have a real vision to work with the leaders in industry, to work with governments, to work with heads of companies, to really see that they can change the entire environment for themselves and all the people in their company so that self-development isn't a luxury for the chosen few. Mm. Um, you know, that actually we can make the world a better place for everybody. If we can find out how your identity is running the day, then you get to choose differently. And it's only when your identity is running the day that you end up in arguments with people, you end up resisting growth, and that's how wars and stuff start. And, you know, I'm, I'm just a real stand that we all get a different life. We all get to live life in a way that really works for everyone. Amazing. Polly, you are a huge inspiration. <laughs> and this has been mind-bendingly wonderful. So <laughs> I really appreciate your time to come and talk with me today. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much. Thank you. Right. And that's a wrap. Thank you so much for listening. And don't forget to book your 15-minute chat with me by using the link in the information. I look forward to speaking with you. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.